Okay, well, Alan Needle is a conservation biologist at Manomet Bird Observatory in Massachusetts, focused on shorebird research in Eastern Massachusetts, as well as wimbrel conservation efforts in the Atlantic Flyway. He works in science and education at Manomet, in particular monitoring songbird populations at Manomet's long-term banding station and in restoration of retired cranberry bogs into wetland habitat. He worked in Alaska on shorebird research some years ago with Alex Lamoureux. And so he joined Alex leading Orange Audubon's trip to Maine with Wildside Nature Tours uh, this past summer. And uh, we liked him a lot and invited him to the festival and are really pleased that he's giving this talk on his research. Welcome, Alan. All right, thanks a lot, Deb. I think I've got my, it's my screen sharing. Do you see it fine? Great. Um, I really appreciate being invited to talk to all of you and looking for those of you I haven't met in person yet. I hope to, um, under a month's time, meet some of you in person and uh, get out birding in your neck of the woods. So as Deb mentioned, I work for Manomet, which is a nonprofit based in Massachusetts, but our work really spans throughout the hemisphere. And for my part at Manomet, a lot of my work is focused on shorebird conservation, which, you know, shorebirds, I'm not sure how all of you, how deep a knowledge you all have for shorebirds, but when I say shorebirds, I'm talking about sandpipers and plovers, oyster catchers, willets, things like that, as opposed to waterfowl or wading birds. And when we talk about shorebirds, we're often thinking about well, some of the longest flying birds of all. And you can kind of think of them broken down into flying in different flyways. And both in Florida and in Massachusetts, where I work, we're talking about the Atlantic Flyway. And second here. So Manomet's approach to shorebird conservation kind of necessarily is a three-pronged approach that focuses on conducting science, uh, working with regional partners for site conservation, and also looking at ways to ha manage habitats to improve habitats for shorebirds. And kind of these three approaches are all working together uh, to reverse the decline of shorebirds. And so for the scope of my talk today, I'm gonna focus on a couple different areas within the United States, within the Atlantic Flyway, uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where a lot of my work takes place, and then also the Georgia Bight, which stretches from Cape Hatteras to the St. John's River near Jacksonville. And so I'll start out with highlighting Cape Cod, which is a, the outermost part of Eastern Massachusetts, highlighted here in yellow, and really is st sitting out quite prominently compared to the rest of the Atlantic coast. And because of that, it's attractive to a lot of migrating shorebirds that are coming out of the Arctic and subarctic on the way to their wintering grounds. And so that area is a critical staging area for thousands of migratory shorebirds. And I'm not sure if any of you have visited there before, but one of the um, most important sites there is called Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge, which is a site of regional importance for shorebirds. The WIZARN acronym there stands for the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, which is a program that Manmet puts forth of identifying uh, the most important sites for shorebirds in the Western Hemisphere uh, to, to encourage uh, conservation of those areas. And so in Massachusetts in particular, uh, I'm, I'm working on research of a few particular species, which I'll highlight and then down the line, looking at steps we might be able to take to improve the area for shorebirds. As Deb mentioned a little in the introduction, one of the species I work with 
most closely is the Wimbrel, which I'm guessing you probably see some numbers of. And if you travel up to Georgia and South Carolina during the spring, you probably can see lots of them if you know where to go. Uh, in Massachusetts, Wimbrels mostly come through during the fall uh, from Ju July through September. And it's an ideal location for us to study, in, in particular, juvenile Wimbrels that are coming south for the first time during September. And so you can, if you look closely in the top left picture there, you'll see a small satellite transmitter with a little solar, solar panel on it. And so we've been deploying these on Cape Cod for several years now on juveniles to get kind of the first data of its kind to track juveniles during their first years of life. And this is part of a larger effort by many organizations to um, get tags on Wimbrels in various locations to map out their migration paths and identify those really important spots for us to focus our conservation efforts. So uh, I'll sh share a, one map here, which is pretty neat. These are uh, departure flights of Wimbrels out of Massachusetts over the last si seven years or so that we've tagged. And all of these except for two are juveniles. And it, we've started to notice a pretty clear pattern of birds coming out of Massachusetts heading to Venezuela and all going to the north coast of South America. And which is interesting, a lot of these juveniles are spending two to three years on their wintering grounds before ever doing a flight north. And so you think of a, you really can think of these birds as tropical birds that are occasionally coming north, which sometimes you hear songbirds described as, but, but in case of the shorebirds, they might be spending two or three years before ever coming north again to breed. And as I mentioned, there's been a lot of Wimbrels tagged in places other than Massachusetts as well. And this map here gives another example of kind of the hemispheric patterns that you can see. And a lot of our recent work with Wimbrels has shifted out of the Atlantic flyway per se and into the mid mid-continent. As you can see, a lot of these birds that are passing through the Atlantic flyway on their southbound migration on the right side of the map are then crossing over the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico in the spring and going to the Gulf Coast, particularly Louisiana and East Texas. And so that if we are, you know, our goal is to reverse the declines of wimbrel populations, you can start to use this sort of data, identify these really pinch points within their annual cycle that we can focus our efforts. And that's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation, but the story of what's going on in the Gulf Coast is really interesting as well. All these wimbrels that are in the salt marshes on their on their way south are all in rice and crawfish fields eating crawfish down there. And as far as we can tell, they're doing fairly well during that time there, but we still are just starting to scratch the surface of what we understand about the rate behavior there. So we'll have a lot of time for questions at the end if anyone has any questions about Wimbrel specifically, but I'm gonna shift gears to another bird that is taking up a lot of our time in the conservation world of shorebirds, and that's the red knot, um, which is important. Massachusetts and uh, the Georgia bite are both very important places for red knots during their annual migrations. And in particular, while they're in Massachusetts, they're feeding in mussel beds, which is the bottom left photograph here with that stippled black pattern there is a mussel bed. And the bird in the top left is eating a young mussel that it's ripped off of that mussel bed. And so, well, Massachusetts is a really important place for red knots. They've, historically, they've abandoned several sites that they used to be at and are currently declining pretty rapidly out on outermost Cape Cod where they're found. And so this will be my one foray into kind of some really abstract science that might be hard to wrap your head around. And I confess, I'm still wrapping my head around it as well. But we've started to apply this new sampling technique that uh, is called eDNA, which stands for environmental DNA. And what it means in short 
is that we can take small samples of sediment or fecal samples and a lab can analyze that small sample and get a signature of all the living things that are present at that location. And so this method can be potentially used to rapidly characterize, um, say, invertebrate communities on a mudflat and an, a method that previously would have required, you know, manually digging up pounds and pounds of sand and sifting through them for, for all the actual critters. And so this year, I've just started to pilot a new project on Cape Cod, uh, collecting both fecal samples of red knots. I, I follow them around and literally just watch them poop and go up and collect the poop in a vial. And then also have some standardized sites that I'm sampling sediment at to get to whether their prey selection and the distribution of their prey is potentially driving their declines. Um, this is just a little summary graphic of what I'm talking about there of you get your sample and then I really literally have to read this caption because it doesn't come naturally to me, but they have this method of being able to, re to take the meta bar, the meta bar coding basically allows them to rapidly identify DNA signatures within a sample and then ways to amplify ones that are particularly likely to be from invertebrates. And so this last year I've gone out and these are, that's all red knot poop on the fecal sample side and then me collecting sediment samples as well. And I'm only just starting to get some results. So I can't actually tell you what they're eating other than what I would guess, but I do have a, a very interesting, mind-boggling graph here, I would say, which each one of those lines represents just one of those little vials of sample sediment or fecal samples. And each single sample, the sample size on the x-axis is how many DNA signatures is, are picked up in one of those samples. And on that y-axis is the number of unique signatures or species. And so you can see that in a single sample, the eDNA analysis is picking up 50,000 DNA signatures of between 200 and 400 unique types, which could be 200 to 400 species. And so thankfully, the partners at the University of Maine eDNA lab that we're working with have a lot of methods to be able to parse this out to the likely kind of subset of invertebrates that we're interested in and be able to track the abundance and presence of these throughout the annual cycle that I'm out there sampling. So that's pretty crazy stuff. I mean, I did not make this graph, the, the lab didn't send it to me. And I was, I was really tickled to see it and excited to see that the, um, the sampling method is working. And within a year or so, we'll actually have some results, I think. Um, but to continue our whirlwind tour, I should have come up with some quiz questions, but I wonder if anyone could have identified the, the boundaries of what the Georgia bite are technically and what the technical boundaries are from Cape Hatteras to Cape Canaveral, highlighted here in yellow. But Manwet's work within the Georgia bite and our shorebird conservation initiative really are most focused on the region from the mouth of the St. Johns River up to the boundary of North Carolina and South Carolina. And that is mostly because that is where the largest numbers of shorebirds are present, particularly during migration. And a lot of the largest sections of suitable habitat. And so my coworkers, Abby Sterling and Allie Heiser are full-time shorebird scientists. Um, Abby's based out of Brunswick and Allie out of Tybee Island. And they know this subject matter, matter better than I do, but I'm still gonna highlight some of the work that they're doing down there. I've been down a couple times to help them do wimbrel surveys that um, in the spring, counting the roost sites down there, particularly in Georgia. And, identifying some of the key night roosts and getting a head count of how many wimbrels are there. 
So I should also quiz you all on what shorebirds these are right now, but I won't risk opening the floor. But in the top left, we have a piping clover. I should also quiz you what age that piping clover is, but that's a juvenile fledged piping clover. And down in the bottom left, we have some red knots, some dowagers, some sanderlings, and some a semi-pollinated sandpiper and a dunlin, it looks like. It's actually a pretty diverse photograph there. Um, but the Georgia bite in general is supporting 300,000 shorebirds annually. You might wonder how you come up with a number like that. And I can't tell you. Other than that, you can do calculations based on estimated rates of turnover within a staging area and also just straight up counts of birds throughout the seasons. And as I had mentioned, the site designations, kind of the three really focal areas are the barrier islands within the state of Georgia, the Altamaha River Delta, and then the Cape Romaine Santee Delta. And Abby's approach down there is really trying to take a community approach to shorebird conservation. And one of their big challenges down there is the there's only four public beaches and then the rest of kind of the beaches that people go to are barrier islands and remote beaches that people travel to by boat. And that makes um, regulation pretty challenging, which I'll get, get into in a little bit. But first to do a little more background, uh, similar to Massachusetts, uh, Georgia Bites are a great place for red knots, particularly during spring migration. And as some of you may know, they're really keying into horseshoe crabs. And the most famous red knot was a bird that went to Delaware Bay year after year and is recited by its color band, but it was known as B95 and came through Delaware Bay for 20 years. And was the subject of the book, The Moon Bird, because you added up the distance the bird had traveled in those 20 years, and it was the same distance as from here to the moon, which is pretty spectacular. Um, and the picture there in the bottom right is are some fiddle or some horseshoe crab eggs, and then the spawning horseshoe crabs in the top left. And Abby and I are actually looking to apply some of these similar eDNA techniques that we're establishing the protocol protocol up, up here in Massachusetts down in Georgia to kind of parse out um, the role that that's serving for red knots. Um, but in addition to a spring migration focus with the red knots, in contrast, uh, in Massachusetts, most of the shorebirds actually leave during the winter. So it's really only Sanderling and Dunlin up here during the winter. Uh, the Georgia bite in Florida, where you all are really a, a critical place for wintering shorebirds as well. And so I'm going to highlight, I just chose to highlight a couple with the more charismatic large shorebirds here that uh, spend the winter in this area. Uh, one of the more interesting stories is the long billed curlew, which within the Georgia Bight now only has a wintering population of about 15 or 20. But it used to be many more if you read back the accounts of Audubon, it seemed to be in the hundreds at least. And the decline seems to have been caused by market hunting during the 1800s and they just haven't been able to recover their population. And so now it's a very small breeding population, but there's a few few spots where you can still go to see them. And um, maybe it's possible they'll start, their numbers will rebound a little bit. Um, I had to throw in this photograph I took of a comparison photograph of long billed curlew and a wimble that I took. But I confess it was, I took it in Texas where long billed curlews are a bit more abundant, but out on a, an outer beach in East Texas and kind of highlights the they both have long bills for birds, but the long billed curlew's bills a bit longer. And then the wimbrel has those racing stripes on the head, whereas the long billed curlew is just more of a uniform pattern on the head. And you can just see the hints of the cinnamon wings of the long billed curlew as well, which when it 
you see its underwing, it's very cinnamon, like a marble godwit, as opposed to the wimbrel. But other than that, they're both both good at probing down holes. The wimbrel really focuses on fiddler crabs for most of the year, going down fiddler crab holes. Um, but I thought I'd highlight a couple studies that have been done by other scientists, but have are now within the community of shorebird scientists that have really illuminated some of the patterns of migration for these shorebirds. This is, I apologize for it being a little fuzzy, but this is a tracked long-billed curlew that was wintering, tagged in December of 2015 in coastal Georgia and tracked to its breeding grounds. And you can see it's connecting this area with the prairies, inland prairies of Saskatchewan which is where the long-billed long curlews breed. If you've ever been lucky to be go to Yellowstone or that area of the interior west, that's where you could see a long-billed curlew breeding. And similar to that link between the southeast coast and the inland prairies, well, as an aside, one bird that really is that very strong link is the western subspecies of the willet, which is the really common willet that you see during the winter. But that, that willet actually breeds entirely in the up in the Midwest, whereas the eastern willet that breeds on the Atlantic coast goes all the way to South America. But that's another presentation. Um, another one that I'd love to highlight, just because I love them so much, is the marble god wit, which if it had a down curve bill, you could say it looks a lot like a long billed curlew, but its bill's reversed and it's upturned. And similarly, this is another map where it's, these are marble godwits with transmitters on them from three different deployed locations. But if you look at the, the ones with circles and the ones that are linked to Georgia, you can once again see a, a link to basically North and South Dakota as breeding grounds for the marble godwit. And Similarly, less common than they used to be, but maybe still around 2,000 or so, maybe mostly in South Carolina as a wintering population now. Um, that's kind of a rough, rough estimate. Um, and shifting from the biggest shorebirds down to a, a tiny one, back to the piping plover, something that is important to point out here and why I have this map on here is to point out the different breeding populations of piping plovers and both on the Atlantic coast where they're breeding on coastal beaches, including here in Massachusetts, then in the Midwest prairie region, similar to the, the Godwits and the Longbill Curlews, and then also on the Great Lakes. If you look closely, you can see a little bit of red around some of the Great Lakes. And the amazing thing about this stretch of coastline is that through the reciting of color banded birds, you can see that birds from all three of these breeding populations are coming down to this coastline to spend the winter, which really amplifies the importance of it as a, a safe haven for all populations of the piping clover, which and it, as a total population, there might only be five to 10,000 individuals. One, one particularly special story about an individual and the beautiful thing about being able to have color banded individuals like this is that they really become you'd be able to tell the individual story of a bird and kind of bring a a human aspect to it that can reach reach a bit of a larger audience than just kind of the, the abstract science it becomes a little more of a human interest story which can introduce people to shorebirds and this particular piping plover on the right, which you can see it's orange and black bands. So this bird came from a nest that was laid in a busy off-road vehicle area at Silver Lake State Park in Michigan. So um, right in the Great Lakes. And to help them survive, the eggs were hatched in a captive rearing facility and returned to the park once the chicks were mobile. And the chicks survived and now they're actually being that chick is being seen linked down to the South Carolina coast. 
And I think even more recently, there's been some really famous piping plovers nesting just outside of Chicago uh, that I'm not sure where they've been linked to for wintering grounds, but were the, I believe they were the first, maybe it was the first Illinois pair of piping plovers in a really long time. But I often forget that they breed on the Great Lakes and because I'm so focused on the Atlantic coast, I think of them as a saltwater bird, but they're also out nesting in the, the edges of alkaline lakes and sandy habitats out in the prairies as well. Um, so for my final section, I just wanted to shift gears a little bit from this kind of barraging y'all with science and graphs and stuff like that and shift the gears into you know the assumption with doing shorebird working in shorebird conservation is that uh, shorebird populations are in peril and in decline and through long-term monitoring we know that's true but it's you know we're also intent on identifying ways to reverse declines and identify what's causing the declines to begin with and particularly within the Georgia bite uh, Abby and Allie are focusing on the impact of disturbance. And so when you think of disturbance in the technical sense, you know, it really means any any activity which alters the natural behavior of a bird. And when you think about these birds resting on their long migrations, it, um, any kind of extra energy they're expending can lessen their body condition and if they're breeding, such as you know some of the coastal species there as well, um, threaten their their chicks. If they're Wilson's plovers or oyster catchers or things like that, and so you can think about dog dogs off leash leash, or heading out to your remote island and with your boat and cutting loose because you think you're all by yourself. But in fact, you're if you're in a remote place, you're probably also around a lot of birds, and so. Manomet has really identified that disturbance is one of the real angles within the Georgia bite that we can take some tangible steps to kind of curb some of the negative impacts that are occurring to shorebirds uh, throughout both the breeding season, migratory period, and the winter. winter. And so, as I kind of alluded to earlier, one of the challenges is that there's only four publicly accessible beaches in Georgia where this is actually, <clears throat> this particular program is exclusively in the state of Georgia at this point. Um, there's only four publicly accessible beaches and everything else is remote. So you, you got to think about law enforcement is not necessarily going to be going out to the remote barrier islands and going to all these places that are difficult to get to. And so it requires kind of a three-pronged approach and really focusing on positive messaging and building partnership with those who are invested within both the tourism and recreation industries to kind of create a cultural change that could have um, a sustainable long-term impact. And so these three approaches are creating wildlife beach zones at public beaches, a certification program for ecotourism companies, and also an, the all in the same boat outreach with recreational boaters, which takes places at boat ramps and marinas. And so I'll just briefly highlight these three. Uh, that's Allie there in the top middle. And so this is probably something you've seen some version of this before at beaches around you of being able to mark out, identifying the really important locations and de designating them as wildlife beach zones and just trying to physically keep people out of sites on the public beaches where there's going to be a high volume of people. Excuse me. And so, as you can see here, this is just kind of an example of identifying, you know, the end of an island, the sandy ridge where birds such as black skimmers might be breeding and um, working to get the signage out and talk to the locals about what all the signage means. Um, and 
you know, the really goal is to kind of build also to build local pride with the residents and use consistent marketing across the coast to make it easy and recognizable and also to focus on the year round protection and hoping that all of this will work towards the actual behavior shift in people. So, and another really impressive approach here that is done in partnership with the University of Georgia Marine Extension and the Georgia Sea Grant is to create this certification program for eco tour guides where you can guess what it's guess what it means by what it sounds like but it's both a field program and an online certification program online where um, eco tour guides can get certified um, by going through this coursework of understanding the importance of shorebirds and how they can actually take the knowledge of just basic shorebird identification and increasing their ecological understanding will also improve their function as an eco tour guide, though originally they might just be a, a guide to take people out fishing or to get them out to a site for something else now that they can incorporate this into their work. And, you know, with a lot of things in this field, it's about and just a lot of these people just increasing awareness and out of that awareness can come concern. Um, and then similarly, their final approach is to just do straight up outreach with recreational boaters. And that's, which has barely been met with a lot of success, uh, particularly at marinas and boat ramps and marinas in particular have ended up being very enthusiastic about being able to offer some sort of programming and also just being out at the marinas and talking to people and having tables and just trying to break the, you know, scratch the surface of um, share, sharing some shorebird knowledge and just opening their eyes a little bit. And so I chose to end with that just because I find it a very, you know, refreshing and impactful work that they're doing there to improve the conditions for shorebirds there that is not your prototypical, you know, land conservation or um, strict law enforcement of arresting people. And it's a more of a holistic approach that if um, providing, you know, passing on these beliefs could then be a really sustainable, you know, teach it to the parents, pass it on to their kids sort of thing that could uh, have a lasting impact as opposed to just um, making people angry and fining them for bad behavior. Um, so that's, that was the end of my scheduled talk. Um, I know that was, upon reflection, quite the whirlwind of content, and I'm sure all your heads are spinning. But I'd be happy to answer all the questions you have, um, whether they're about stuff that was in the presentation or just shorebirds in general. Um, if any, if I sped through any of the background information and you just like me to about us open the field to any questions you have, but thank you. All right, there's a few in the chat while um, some people are maybe thinking. Um, Juanita asked, why do you think they use different patterns, I guess, of migration in the spring and the fall? Well, that's a great question. Uh, does anyone, anyone in the audience want to take, take a guess? You can unmute yourself. It's fine. I'll say that when Deb was pulling up on her favorite new website has a lot to do with it. I'm not sure if that was before the official presentation. Well, yeah. you talked about all of the food sources that yep. are different, probably on each route. Uh, so you're saying it could be hurricanes and things? Yeah, so one is definitely food sources, but a big key of a lot of what's driving the long, the long distance flights are prevailing wind patterns and so these birds a lot of these the roots are followed by lots of different species and 
prevailing wind patterns, for example, generally over the Gulf of Mexico in the spring, there's a nice southerly flow, you know, south to north, a really great tailwind going north and uh, going out over the Atlantic, heading south, you might be likely to hit north winds that are a tailwind as well. And we have amazing stories of individual tag birds departing the Atlantic coast under seemingly ideal conditions and halfway across the Atlantic running into hurricanes and things like that. And just a bird that my coworker Shiloh tagged in a wimbrel that he tagged in Alaska this, this summer uh, was spending its southbound staging period in the eastern shore of Virginia, it was there for a month or so and took off right when a hurricane was due south and actually had to fly back to mainland Florida and then went back up to Virginia and then spent a couple of weeks and then took off again. So it's very site faithful to that one staging area, which is uh, something I really didn't emphasize enough of this, how shorebirds in general are very, have high site fidelity of, um, and, but yeah, I'd say it has a lot to do with wind patterns and then also uh, capitalizing on locations that have abundant food sources for that those dates. Interesting. Let's see. So um, Terry asked, how long does the flight Cape Cod to the Antilles take? He says, I, I assume they can't feed along the way. Yep, that's... That is very true. You're, one thing I always like to, as all of your bird nerds, you probably know this, but some of the sometimes I give talks to people who know nothing about birds and have to point out they know wimbrels aren't like hawks that can soar and they're not like ducks that can sit on the water. So they're flapping constantly and not able to stop over the water. And so it's once they, they're going, they're kind of going um, unless they fly over Bermuda by chance, but that's probably pretty slim. So it could take about four days nonstop. And so for only this, this is really the first year that uh, we've, we've started to deploy transmitters that have the ability to track meteorological conditions such as wind, wind speed of where the bird is and also the speed of the bird as well and so and also altitude and so birds that we worked with University of Oklahoma Wimbrels in eastern Texas this spring deployed 20 tags there specifically for to understand how birds are behaving within the atmosphere and some of those birds were going well over 100 miles per hour that due to tailwinds and sometimes up to five or ten thousand feet in the sky so it's wow. it seems daunting from the you know, it seems like a incomprehensible journey but the more i learn about it the more i realize that they're really built for this in a lot of respects and if they have the good enough sites to fill up on food and fuel reserves to prepare for the flight that uh, they really are, are built to do it. And it, they fly during the day? They migrate during the day? Yeah, so, so typically they depart in the evening, but then would be flying, yeah, day and night. Wow. Um, so Juanita said she took a photo of a fledgling banded piping plover that arrived on her Atlantic Beach, Indian River, Indian River County, and it fledged in the Wisconsin Lake that you showed. It's interesting. Oh, cool. And Dory asks, how are breeding conservation strategies for states different from wintering locations? How successful are the strategies in wintering locations? Well, I'll start with the last question. So, it's a loaded question. It's a really challenging topic is a lot of the shorebirds that are in the greatest decline are spending the winter in South America, uh, a lot in the North Coast of South America. And a lot of that coastline is pretty remote. 
uh, but at the same time, that's kind of a double-edged sword of being lots of habitat, but also there's risk of actual hunting still for food, especially for wimbrels and the lesser Antilles and the Guyanas of the north coast of South America. Uh, even though it's technically illegal, for example, in Suriname, uh, there's still lots of shorebird hunting going on for sustenance, which um, you can't really fault a family that is has the option of, you know, shooting some shorebirds or going hungry. But at the same time, it's a challenge regulation-wise. Um, for example, in Suriname, I know that shorebird hunting is illegal, but they have two rangers for the entire country, the entire coastline, basically. And so uh, even if the, that law is in place, it can be tough to regulate. Um, and I forget the first half of the question. OK, let me, let me go find it. Um, how are how breeding are... conservation strategies for states different from wintering locations? Yeah, so <clears throat> well, if you, yeah, if you think about it, like breeding locations are challenging because the birds are linked to their nest. And they're also linked to their babies, which can't fly. And so it's a lot of breed. So I guess it also depends on if we're talking about shorebirds that are breeding and say the, the lower 48 states on beaches, such as piping plovers and snowy plovers and oyster catchers and things like that, then it really comes down to being very reliant on stewards and people to help identify their key spots and either put up signage. Um, and in some, some cases, it comes down to controlling predators that are, you know, coyote, even if they're native species, if it's a listed species such as piping plover, doing things such as predator control to help kind of stem the tide. Um, and for the species that are breeding in the far flung north and the boreal forest and in the tundra, it's, it's different in that it's very remote and mostly undeveloped, but also rapidly changing due to climate change and um, forest forest, like the boreal forest is encroaching very slightly northward and some of the wetlands that shorebirds breed in on the tundra are only wetlands because the water is sitting on top of the, the frozen ground, the permafrost. And so if some hypothesize that if the permafrost starts to melt, then the, the lay, layout of a lot of those wetlands will change because the water might just start seeping into the ground. Um, and but that could be a really long story, but there's an answer. The semi-palmated sandpiper needs the Bay of Fundy as a stopover. Can you tell that story? Yeah, that that is a true statement. Um, yeah, so the Bay of Fundy is one of the, the key spots for tracking trends in semi-palmated plover numbers. And declines in that location in particular have kind of been uh, the reason for a lot of conservation work relating to semi palmated sandpipers and research. Um, Manomet, I guess over the last 10 years, maybe 10 years or so, it's kind of hit the news waves that numbers of semi palmated sandpipers were really declining in the Bay of Fundy. And so uh, the challenge with them is that they're so they're tiny is that you can't necessarily deploy the same sort of technology on them to figure out whether they're just staging it. The really the challenging thing, particularly I'll just stick, keep to the Bay of Fundy concept is how do you know whether the whole population is declining or are they just going somewhere else? Like how do you get to that question? Like um, if all the people in a city are staying at one hotel and you go to that year and the, and then the second hotel is built and the first hotel has less people, they're 
plus people or are the birds somewhere else, you know? Um, and so that's a really tough thing for people in my field of work is to figure out whether birds are shifting to new locations. It's similarly with red knots, like the way to track outside of like flying the their wintering grounds, the way to track red knot populations is in Delaware Bay because everyone says that that's where the, the red knots go. And if you fly, fly Delaware Bay and count the red knots every year, you'll be able to track their populations. And it's not necessarily that easy though. And I, I took the graphic out of this presentation, but I could send it along as recent use of these things called nano tags on which you report to cellular networks there are these little towers instead of to satellites have shown that red knots for example in the georgia bite florida coast to, to south carolina in the spring feeding on horseshoe crabs are actually going straight to the arctic and not going to delaware bay at all which was previously thought and so if numbers are down in Delaware Bay, it might be that there's more down in Georgia or South Carolina. And so it can be kind of a confounding results when you see declines at just a single location. And when you're talking about a bird that flies from the Canadian Arctic to Tierra del Fuego, the distance from South Carolina to Delaware is really not that much. And so it really requires a zoom out lens to figure out whether a decline in a population is true or whether they're just going somewhere else. But yes, in general, the Bay of Fundy is a very important place. I've never been there in person, but heard lots of stories, impressive stories of the numbers there. Okay, last call for questions. That's all that was in the chat. Um, Natasha's here and she studied the Wimbrels on the Devereux Bank. Was that something that they they just more recently found that that spot and changed their their migration. Are you asking me or yeah, <laughs> I? It, it, you know. Um, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe it was a biologist in South Carolina um, that discovered that. Um, I think it was in two thousand. 15 maybe but then it didn't become public until most recently um yeah i think it was around that time i made it may be 15 or 16 um when they made that discovery on uh devoe bank but i'm not exactly 100 sure which year but i know it didn't become public until most recently but the the hypothesis is that that's a new location for them if... um i'm not 100 percent sure i it may like I don't I'm not sure if they know for sure it's a new location or not um, because they just found that that was happening um, at that time. So maybe it's been happening, but no one saw it. <laughs> so it's possible. Yeah, I'd say that's right. Uh, my understanding yeah. is that uh, Felicia Sanders, who works for yeah, Felicia. South mm -hmm. Carolina DNR, kind of stumbled across it just because she was not usually out at DeVoe Bank that time of day and was out, mm -hmm. I think, really early in the morning and saw that there was yes. a lot of wimbrels roosting on DeVoe Bank. And they're only there at night. So if you're not particularly with wimbrels and identifying these really important night roosts, if you're not there in the evening or mm -hmm. first thing in the morning, we would you'd have no idea they were there. And so I think that was the real the stimulus of um, her starting to investigate it more thoroughly. And now she has a grad student who's a former Manomet staff member, Mena Handmaker, mm -hmm. who's in a Nathan Center, her advisor, who recently moved from South Carolina up to University of Massachusetts Amherst. Or she's doing her PhD work on that roost and figuring out how they're dispersing out from that roost to feed during the day. And, discovering some really amazing stuff. We had one more question come in. It's from Brennan, or it might be from Ethan. Um, 
Anyways, how effective is protection of important migratory stopover points? Is it a good method to increase shorebird numbers? Yes. Um, in short, yes. And it's really, it's both a, a good and bad ask. That's both a blessing and a curse of shorebird behavior that they re rely on these very specific sites. So they're doing these long flights to this one spot and on to another spot, but they're very loyal to those sites. And so if you can, and often all the shorebirds will be at those sites. And so, yes, if you can identify those spots then and conserve them, that could be a very effective strategy and much more effective than say, if how do you come up with a, you know, conservation strategy for a cerulean warbler conserving its migratory path. If, depending on the way the wind blows, it might end up in a uh, a vacant lot or someone's front yard or send an entire state altogether uh, during migration. They just don't really have the the same flying fortitude and to be able to hone in on the exact same spots during their migrations. And so um, that's the one positive side of that aspect of shorebirds is that if you can identify, which, um, identify these really important hubs and create a network of them that um, it can be an effective conservation strategy for sure. And you go to those places and you'll see lots of shorebirds and it's a little more difficult for the breeding grounds and wintering grounds because especially the breeding grounds, they're all dispersed. Uh, even though there might be millions of them in the Arctic, they each have their own territories and you walk for five miles and might see you know, two or three pairs of black-bellied plovers. But so it's, it's different. Um, but I would say definitely an effective strategy and uh, the be best strategy we've got. Well, thank you. We've gotten a lot of positive comments on your presentation. Thank you, says Juanita. And Laura says, amazing. Cool. And Paula says, interesting. So we really appreciate your time. Cool. I took off the last slide, but I'll just put in my chat, the chat, my email, and also Abby, Abby's email, who runs the, the Georgia Bite initiative, in case you have any questions. But I'm always happy to answer any questions you have, and or you can just save them for a couple of weeks from now, and I can answer them in person. Person, yeah, sign up. Remember, there's there's like four trips that he still has availability on. So sign up soon. All right. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks again, Alan. I'm going to end this. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Good night, everybody.